science fiction and fantasy enthusiasts, and welcome to our podcast with Ryan Sean O'Reilly, David Wilkinson, and Richard Mel. You're listening to No Deodorant in Outer Space. Now, let's get started. There is evil. It's actual, like cement. I can't believe it. I can't stand it. Evil is not a view. It's an ingredient in us, in the world, poured over us, filtering into our bodies, minds, hearts, into the pavement itself. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly, Chief Inspector of the Kempitai from the Japanese Pacific States. Joining me on this program is David Wilkinson, Obergruffenfuhrer from the Greater Nazi Reich. Why, why am I a Nazi? Dave? Fuck. I hope to find out in this episode. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a Jew, legitimately. I'm, I'm the hell. That's what makes it ironic. I don't. I, let's do what white people do and discuss what irony means. Like, how much that means it's ironic, but okay, fine. And you jab from the center, although not an ideology. Richard Mel from the West Coast Resistance Movement, hiding out in the neutral zone. Oh, I saw. No, no, wait, stop. Ryan's Japanese. That's the wrong accent. That's the wrong accent. Wait, isn't Mel a German name? What the fuck? Mel is German, but my mother's mother's mother is named Cohen. (laughs) So you got a little heave in you. Good, good. Mm Mm-hmm. Yet, yet. Straight up. And that that was a straight up Japanese. (laughs) Ryan's a Japanese. All right, fine. Let's uh, go on. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, on this episode of the podcast, we are, I guess, returning to form, and we're going to be covering a Philip K. Dick novel, one of his uh, more famous novels, The Man in the High Castle, which came out in 1962. 19... 62, yes. Now, real quick. We will also oh. be discussing, well, we will also be discussing the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle, which came out in 2015 and was directed by, uh, well, the, the showrunner creator was Frank Spotnitz and starred Alexa Davalos. And that came out in 2015. We're only going to be co- covering season one. But what were you going to say? Well, how many dick jokes am I allowed to make in this episode? I mean, just pun- as many as you want. I mean, okay. I'm just trying to exhaust your entire I, I, I almost feel like we should joke. do a post edit where we can add little dings in every time I make a dick joke or one of us does about us loving dick. Right. Get on that. Us wanting dick. <laughs> Well, more work for me. <laughs> Sounds great. Except, you know, except you know, make a a doing uh, sound effect instead of a ding sound 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 effect. Since it's a dong that you're referring no, to, like dang, 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 like that. A- any general updates for you guys? I know, um, Rick, uh, you got a new job, so no, that's yeah. good. After your pr- quest to the west, you returned quest and- to the west. I returned, and I thought I was going to land a job here in Chicago, and they had filled the position before I got back. So I had to kind of scramble, look for another job. This particular company had telling me that hmm. I was going to work in Chicago full time, and now I'm finding out I might be working in Des Moines for the next year. What the fuck? So, oh, really? Uh, they gave you the yeah. really? They gave you the shaft. I know, but <laughs> yeah. wow, it's that's worth amazing. it. The, the experience is excellent. The pay and benefits are good, and the potential for increased pay and benefits are great. So I just got to kind of stick to it and and uproot know, the family. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uproot them from uh, our longtime residents. Wow. That'll be some big changes. Well, hopefully you won't have to do that, but I guess you got to do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. We're all drinking tonight, which is probably not different than the norm, but uh, Wilk, you requested specifically that we all drink wine? I did. I'm coming from a, a big Italian dinner. It was my uh, sister's birthday. We went out to this little small Italian restaurant downtown, and um, oddly enough, kind of such a controversy, I agreed to split the bill with my mom. And apparently my mom ordered three bottles of wine that were $40 a piece, which, boy, that was annoying. <laughs> so, damn. Uh, I mean, the average entree is like $19, $20 this place. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I've never seen her order wine that expensive before. I had to think she'd look at the price. So that was fun. Happy birthday, Julie. It's, it's a pleasure. Happy birthday. But what the fuck, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, So I'm mom? now drinking a $9 bottle of wine that we got at uh, Whole Foods, I believe. That you found on the street, yeah, but <laughs> it was mostly corked. 
<laughs> hey, those Whole Foods dumpsters have great shit in them. Yes. I'm drinking a, a Campo I'm just kidding, Viejo. Though. I think this is from Spain from 2010. From Spain? I, I love Spanish wine, actually. What is it? It's a Campo Viejo. It's like seven years old? From 2010. It's, yeah, let's it see. Was, what year is mine from? Okay, so I don't want to pull a boner. Wait, speaking of boners and speaking of dick, my port is named Rodney Strong from 2007. Mm. Cool. Yeah. We're all right. in a good mood, I think. For- yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's ruin that by continuing with our podcast. All right, let's just go around the room real quick. We're, we're going to cover Man in the High Castle. Let's give it our opening remarks before we cut into the bio, uh, as is our traditional format. So I will start with Wilk. Just your opening one-sentence summary for the book. A chilling look of what could have been told to the eyes of people looking at things as they could have been, which in fact is what it was. I like it. Rick, what do you got for us? A realistic take on current affairs here in the United States of America. Excellent. And I will add... (laughs) What? (laughs) I I love you guys. (laughs) I will add a story of subtle nuances containing picturesque fables that compound reality in philosophic deep strokes. Now, say it in a racist Japanese accent, please, if you're going to do this right. (laughs) <laughs> oh, do it. Story on a I me will with opt, opt out of that <laughs> decision. <laughs> and uh, why don't we move the show along and get into the bio? So now we've covered Philip K. Dick previously twice before. We did him as our very first episode of this podcast when we covered Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was also uh, turned into Blade Runner. And then we uh, covered Total Recall, which was uh, based on a short story called uh, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. So we love Dick. listeners can go back and check those episodes. So we're not going to recover his whole entire bio and you can go listen to those episodes to hear more about him we're going to try to focus this episode a little bit more i think on the time period when he wrote this book so we're going to move things over to rick and rick why don't you give us a little background on philip k dick yeah uh, so the, yeah this is our third time covering Philip K. Dick, and I think we come, we keep coming back to this guy because, you know, from all the authors that we've covered, I think Philip K. Dick is the most daring and the most imaginative. He, he doesn't hold anything back. Um, maybe with the exception of uh, The Running Man, I, I thought that was pretty, you know, just kind of bare knuckles and, and raw, but uh, Philip K. Dick's stuff is consistent uh, and consistent enough for us to come back, keep coming back. What makes this man so daring and creative? Well, he was a child of the 60s, and I think you, you could probably consider him a beatnik. This book was written in 1962. He had the gall to use the I Ching to develop the story, The Man in the High Castle. Why don't you uh, give, uh, explain what the I Ching is? Why don't you give a little ex- explanation of that? So anyone who's not from maybe the Bay Area may, may not know what the I Ching is. And it's um, it's an ancient Chinese oracle. It's a book that is about 5,000 years old or so, maybe 4,500 years old. It's older than the Bible, older than the Old Testament. But it has... 80% of the truth the Bible has, though, too. So it's got that going for it. Sure. Yeah, no, actually, it's kind of funny. I mean, well, I was going to say the I Ching is like the Bible, only, yeah, 80% of the stories in there aren't as true as the Bible. So it's not as truthy as the Bible, but it's, it's pretty good. It holds up. It's got, it's got some interesting sections, good illustrations. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, Philip Kinnick actually wrote a poem about the I Ching during his beating phase, and I have a recording here, which I'm going to play for you. I Ching. He called it the I Ching. So, he called it the I Ching, actually. There you go. No, let's, yeah, listen to the poem. This is Philip Kinnick's own voice. Oh. And that 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 that's a I got that from the Library of Congress. It's it's him doing it's some big poetry. So we're captures the essence. I mean, and really, I mean, yeah, this is during his big phase. He had a lot of odd bursts of vulgarity like that. And but don't let it take away from the work. Rick, go on. Why are you you are citing your sources? I do. I somehow question your sources. <laughs> the Library of Congress. You know, I'm pretty sure the Library of Congress has some audio that you know, will demonstrate. All right, Rick. Uh, what, what else you got? If, I, if, if I'm lying, may God strike you down, Ryan. Okay, so it didn't happen. I guess. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. So in '62, every freaky hippie was totally paranoid because of McCarthyism. That's what was going on. You had, you know, half of the Senate, half of the Congress hunting down people who they thought were communists, and in many cases charging them with treason. 
and it was a it was an entire committee in the House called the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee. Now, is it a fact that during that era it was considered treason to not have sex with a sitting senator if he asked? After six, because I had, well, a lot of people were hunted yeah, down for definitely, yeah, right. and that that was a problem it, too. A lot of it was just kind of retribution, and and it, it was just you know someone rubbed you the wrong way, well then you know accuse them of being communist, and then or if they don't rub you at all, pursue it, which is the problem. Exactly. And I think we talked about this previously. I mean, Philip K. Dick was paranoid. And probably admittedly so. And he actually lived in an environment where paranoia was rampant. He had it going on internally, and it was also going on externally in the world around him. Right. It it, it was real. It was a real thing. It was well documented among the the hippie culture that, you know, if you you were around Berkeley or San Francisco at that point, chances are you you would have to pretty much know who you were selling to or who you were buying from from a very early age in order to have, like, kind of feel good. If, If you didn't, then you were most likely to be ratted out and... Well, probably well, charged and then thrown into jail for, for years. It, 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 but to be fair, I don't think the hippies really were that into documenting things well. So, but moving on. Well, you know, through the music and through the poetry, you kind of get the sense of that, you know. That's uh, that's pretty much kind of like how it was documented. Gotcha. Not so much through, you know, journalism and, you know, you know nonfiction, but yeah. And then in, in retrospect, you know, accounts, uh, you, you hear a lot of that. So... I guess uh, Philip K. Dick, he, he came up with uh, Man in the High Castle partly due to his knowledge of German that he learned in high school. He furthered his uh, his research on uh, World War II and, you know, basically the Nazis. I think Apparently was, there was there was archives kept at the U- University of California, Berkeley. Yeah. And he, he, he kind he of – He, 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 he never bit, finished yeah. college, but he did independent research on his own. Right. And based on his knowledge of German, he was able to read stuff in German. To, and eventually, later in his life, it suited him to do this book. So, so he had a dual interest. He had the, the interest in the I Ching, which brought him closer to the uh, Orient. And he had his uh, Nazi interest, like so many other Americans. Um, but uh, <laughs> it all kind of came together in this one book. And it, you know, I don't think I've ever read anything like this before. This is kind of. It's very, it's very daring, and I don't think it'll ever be done again. But I, you know, it probably was, I guess. Uh, no, you know what? It was done before he did it uh, yeah. with yeah, yeah, uh, he, the he, people who had the uh, the fetishes for civil war. See, bring back the jubilee, or bring what the called? jubilee. Uh, yeah, bring the jubilee. I, I don't, yeah. don't want to knock Phil getting off of a pedestal here, but like everything you're saying is true from a historical standpoint, factual standpoint. But like, I just picture writing this book during a time where he's going from this free loving. Free dick swinging hippie to being locked into a marriage to the woman who's putting him to work, which is the opposite of what I think you want to be doing in the late 60s. She has him working in a jewelry shop, making jewelry, and then he's probably getting irritated with her. They have a kid under five. His life's well, a living hell. Well, anyway, I, I, I've I, always I, seen him as kind of like a puppy dog, you know? I mean, he kind of sticks yeah. with his women until it. A puppy dog with, out, the, you know? with, the dark, with the dark side. A puppy dog I mean, yeah. I, I, I was he married like five, six? Yeah, he was right. married a lot of times. Still he, a okay, so, like, I mean, he's got his own background, but like, eh, let's not read too much into his motivation writing this book. I mean, like, it, he, I mean, he said it was kind of base. He read some book about the South winning the war, the war, and kind of like that. But like, really, I feel there's right. a lot of metaphors in this book for what's happening to him right now. It's it's almost as if uh, there is. It's like a. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity to, you know, inject his own experiences. Well, for sure. he, he was living in the Berkeley scene, right? And he was married for a few years and then he moves out. I think it's to Point Reyes. I don't know if you know that, Rick, or if you got the, if that's the right city. I didn't get the memo. He, oh. he moves out to Point Reyes. And while he's out there with his wife, they get visited by this, I think it's Ann Rubenstein. Wilk, is that right? That's Succubus, yes. The Succubus and the <laughs> sign with her. Who, who was a her, widow her Jewish and had... She had killed her last husband with her Hebrew mojo. And now he writes a book about killing Jews. Coincidence? I think not. So Anne was Anne was a widow, and uh, her her husband was a poet. I think he ed- ed- edited a poet magazine. He he was a magazine editor. Did he kill himself? And she, huh? no, I I'm not sure how he died. But he so she goes. She actually went to their house to visit them, and him and his wife befriended Anne, and they had a friendship. And then eventually, Phil would go see her on his own, and then. Sparks kind of flew between them. Yeah, because mar- and- married men always establish friendships with widows. That's a good idea for a married man to do. Nothing bad's gonna happen there. So he screwed. It happened to Phil. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> he was a special case. He wanted some side pussy, and he got it with Anne Rubenstein, and she locked him into it, and 
pushed a kid out and made him work in the jewelry shop. Yeah, he lived in Point Point Reyes Station, and but and actually Anne's the one who introduced him to the I Ching. She was giving him books about Carl Jung and stuff like that. They had a lot of common connection, I think, intellectually. So, so again, these are all things that are happening right now that happen to go to the book jewelry, Jews, I Ching. Well, the, ju- the jewelry. So what you're talking about there is at some point, I think Phil's career was on the downslope, and, and Phil at this time was really trying to still make it into quote unquote mainstream fiction. All right, he had had success in science fiction, John genre fiction. Uh, and, and science fiction was a lot more looked down on at this time period. And Phil had these aspirations to, to make it in the mainstream. So he was r- still writing like at a furious pace and churning out these mainstream books that he was trying to publish and every once in a while having to resort back to sci-fi stuff. Well, he's kind of on the on a, a downturn. He's not having all that success. And he, I guess, marries Anne. He's living with her. She starts a cottage scale jewelry business. You know, to research this, I I read a a biography called Divine Invasions, A Life of Philip K. Dick, which is written by Lawrence Sutton. It's very good. I didn't finish it. I only read up to the point in his life where he did this, but I want to give a little props to that author. It's a very thorough book, including an index, subject index, and a chronology of his works. And it's it's a great book to check out if you want to learn more about Phil. But she starts, his wife starts this cottage jewelry business and they, and Phil starts to help him. He actually makes their first sale to some local high posh, like jewelry store. And Phil's a creative guy. So Anne was a fan of making these molten shaped jewelry and, and Phil starts to do it and he, he's pretty good at it, but he must have been kind of driving her nuts just because of who he was and his ways. And I don't know if he was kind of clingy and he had paranoia and stuff going on. And eventually she pushed him out of the jewelry business and, uh, Phil was kind of duplicitous in how he would talk about life and stories and he would say things that weren't true or were kind of true. But what he said about that time period was that, you know, he, so Ant's jewelry business is threatening to eclipse his writing business, which he's been doing for 10 years. Classic tale. Happens a lot. And so he he's, he is like, okay, I'm writing an important book right now. So yeah, I'm going to go work on this book while you're doing your jewelry business. And he starts to kind of annoy her because he's constantly coming out out of his study and reading passages to her about his what he's writing at the time. So she suggests that he gets like a writing place. So there's like a hut down the road that the local sheriff owns. And Phil rents that out and, and moves his writing over there. She later regrets that, but Phil sticks with it. And he goes and writes. No wonder he was paranoid. He, he writes The Man in the High Castle during this time period when he moves out of that hut. And he also wrote uh, some other books. This was a very productive time for Phil, and he got some of his best work done at this time period. Because he hated his wife. Well, actually, one of the t- one of the things they talk about is that his domestic situation with this wife, it, you know, eventually it fell apart like, uh, like his marriages tended to do. But he had a very placid life at this point, living out in the country. Uh, they had animals, goats, sheep. I think I read a story about how uh, dogs in the neighborhood were attacking the sheep, and uh, oh, Phil, go on. Phil bought a it, Phil, you know, and sheep come to play in his his uh, earlier work, uh, do a, Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and Phil really loved the sheep, and he had bought a gun to protect the sheep, but then he was not a very good shot, and Ann had to take the gun away from him. This sounds <laughs> implausible. He bought a gun to protect the sheep. He fucking hated. They're living out in the country. The sheep. He hated his life. No, he no, hated no, no. His no. life right now. Everything you're saying. Okay, first of all, no. Yes. He, you, you, uh, let's not act like he didn't hate his what? life. He wrote a book about living under a Nazi regime that was based upon this period of his life. Living well, this was a story that was an idea that he had a long time ago. Uh-huh. That he okay. he said yeah, when he like sat he, down to write yeah. this, so, he he hmm. didn't know what to do, so he just he had this idea, and, he, and then he started using the I Ching, like Rick said, to develop the plot. Yeah, and this is the result of this. Uh, hey, actually, the, the inspiration of this book reminds me of how Tolkien wrote the Lord of the Rings, based on the fact that he just wanted to make a language for these elves, and the story evolved yeah. from there. It was almost the, like the, Phil the, wasn't the, intending the to write this. Is- the Lord of the Rings is about World War II. He can say it wasn't, but it was a metaphor for World War II, and it's pretty so bad. I mean, I'm glad I mean, you boiled that down for us. But this also was about is about World War II, ironically. The dwarves are Jews in the in the Lord of the Rings. So, and they're pretty much wiped <laughs> out. So, yes, it's uh, it's really about. It, it, it parallels the events of World War Two, and this is really about him living with a bitch that he didn't like, and him wishing he could go and fuck other women, which he eventually did. So, and again, all the parallels here. <laughs> the marriage does it does fall apart, but I'm not sure that that's quite the story that the way it that's goes. Not the, that's not what anyone's saying. That's my that's my take on this, and I think it's very obvious because clearly, I mean, he's writing about being lived, living in a Nazi hell on the West Coast, completely out of place. But he has these, gl- and the characters in the book have glimpses of life as how it could be, and 
he used to think, God, I used to be free. I didn't have kids. I could do what I wanted. Now I'm making a goddamn pendant like some weirdo in a shack. That gives me an idea. Typey, type, type, type. At the same time, Tricky Dick Nixon is uh, pursuing, you know, Pinkos in California where he's uh, representative he? and senator. Him. Yeah, de- definitely. I, I know the red. Uh, <laughs> this is after his vice presidency with Eisenhower. What was Tricky Dick up to in so, the 60s? Was he- I think ultimately the, this that. book. Oh, that's cool. Had, I didn't uh, know that. Uh, Poor sales, but it did come out in hardcover, which was a big thing for Phil because I think all his previous works did not come in hardcover. And actually, there's a Philip K. Dick Award that specifically goes to authors who make publish in softcover books because that's how most of his books were published. He gets a recognition for this book a lot. And I think, I don't know if you mentioned this already, Rick, he wins the 1963 Hugo Award. I did not mention that. Prestigious uh, science fiction award. And what saved him is the publisher sells the rights to the science fiction book club and the science fiction fans ultimately prop this book up. His next book, he, 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 when he writes this, he kind of, he, he said he thought he'd finally figured out a way to bring science fiction elements and mainstream elements together that was going to, you know, go on for great success to him. And he's like, I, you know, I finally figured it out. Ultimately, that's not the case. His next book, although I think it's popular, The Martian Time Slip, did not give the sales that he wanted. And he, he this is when he finally gets away from trying to make it as a mainstream writer. And when he gets the, the Hugo Award for this book, his agent ends up delivering a package to his house that's full of like all his mainstream novels that they just can't sell. So he's this like ironic thing where he's trying to break out of science fiction and then it's just he can't, but he, he's he got a knack for it. So, I mean, that that's a good kind of look at his life at that time period. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Rick, about Phil, you know, from this time period. No, you summed it up quite nicely there, Ryan. Okay. Well, and like I said, you know, we've covered him twice before and we, I imagine we're going to cover him again in the future, but, and we can get a different aspects of his life at that point. But then let's move on from here, from Phil, and let's go into the book, The Man in the High Castle. So to start us off, Wilk, I'm going to turn to you and if you could give us a synopsis of, of this book. Ryan, it's going to be difficult to give a synopsis briefly, but like, say, there's like three different plots that are happening in this book. <laughs> yeah. There really are. I well, mean, take your time. Take your time. Okay. So basically, you have three things that are happening on. You have what I call the James Bond element, then you have the shiny arts and craft hour element, and then you have the hybrid of the two, the James Bond meets the artist plot. So, I mean, it, it's in classic Dick fashion, this is a. There's a lot of things going on here, and not everything is wrapped up neatly, and it doesn't always kind of go in the direction I think it's going to go, but it yeah, it's, yeah. it starts off on the the West Coast, and was, which is basically being run and occupied by Japan as if we were a colony, and, you know, the Nazis are on the East Coast. And, uh, well, what you said—the basic premise, just to make that clear to people—is that the is that the Nazis and the Germans win World War II, and America is defeated. Not even so much defeated as that we didn't really participate in the World War. Um, Roosevelt was ass- assassinated early on. We didn't really intervene, and the war came to us because we couldn't stop the invasion of Russia. And yeah, we 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 didn't come out ahead in World War II, and we're occupied by Japan and Germany. That's how the book starts. So yeah, it, we, we couldn't stop Germany's invasion of Russia. Right. So basically, it, I think it opens up, and, and the war is done at this point. We, we're like past the, the time of the war. Yeah, I think fifteen years past, right? It's in the early sixties. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, that sounds right. So if, if, if I recall, the the book opens up um, with a man named Childan. Childan, am I saying that right? Okay. Yeah, Childan. I think, who, I think who's a right. white American? And I'm saying white because it kind of matters in the context of this book. He's a white Native American, Native, not an Indian. Anyways, basic white guy who runs an antique store which specializes in selling old Americana. Images of Americana, be they collector's pistols or Mickey Mouse watches to really Japanese people that are interested in that, that sort of thing. So it's an antique store. Like Civil Civil War antiques and stuff. But it's all counterfeit anyway. You know, it's all kind of fabricated uh, at the current time uh, oh. because there is such a, a premium put on, you know, items of Americana with, with the Japs because they have, you know, these fetishes with old relics. And I guess there aren't enough to go around, so you've got so an industry develops manufacturing uh, of these uh, time sake items, right? Yeah, and you know th- th- that all ties into it later with the, the Frank plot. But then he's yeah. he's basically has to deliver um, a rare artifact, a Civil War souvenir, to a Japanese trade official named Tagomi, 
And as the book begins, yeah. he can't obtain that. What he wanted to get him, so he said, find some sort of substitute. Nicobe wants to give it to a, as a gift to a visiting diplomat or a businessman. That makes sense. And so, meanwhile, there's a man named Frank Frank, who has Jewish ancestry, stronger in the book than in the TV show, who works at a factory, and he is more or less fired from that factory. Were these counterfeit? Uh, antiques are made that Rick was talking about. Right, where they, yeah, and they make some counterfeit, and, and again, this is such a complicated, such a complicated, I, I'm like, I'm trying to, this is not like an easy synopsis to make, so. This is okay. the synopsis. Yeah. You're fine, you're fine, just it, <laughs> so, it, take I mean, your time, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm it's saying, worth like, exploring. Yeah, I, I've never done a synopsis called counterfeit antique plots in, in colonial occupied <laughs> Japan, west coast of the United States. Anyways, it, it's ridiculous, but yeah, so anyways, this factory makes normal things, and they also, on the side, make counterfeit artifacts, so apparently there's a market for that, which frankly seems ridiculous, but that's the convention of the book. So does that, he's fired, so then he teams up with an ex, with a former employee, and they go and they basically advise people that these they're making these fake things, so they can blackmail the foreman to meet their own ends. Meanwhile, Frank Freak has an ex, her name is Juliana, and she is caught up in Colorado, which is more or less a neutral area, and she meets up with a truck driver named Joe, who may be more than what he lets on. Okay, he's a na- Nazi assassin ooh, ooh, ooh. who are go- who wants to go meet dun, dun, dun. wants to go meet a person <laughs> who is writing books about what would life be like if Germany and Japan had lost the war, and he is the man in the high castle. And that plot kind of reminded me of that great Coppola film, Apocalypse Now, where they had to go kill the general. He's on a mission to go kill him, which doesn't go so well. But that's that's the book. And, and, and again, I think I had told Ryan previously, I didn't know what to talk about this. It kind of reminds me of a classic episode of Seinfeld, or Kirby Enthusiasm, where there's basically three yeah. plots mm. that all kind of happen separately, but merge together in the end and caught. Well, it's not a comedy. It's it's a it's even a dark tale. I I, I found it a very interesting read, a world building thing. But again, with with Dick, it's it's not enough to create this world. He has to make us question the reality of it throughout it. Like it's almost. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and again, there I don't know how much, but like there's elements in this book that like where Tagomi, the person I mentioned earlier gets caught up gazing at a, a jeweled necklace and has a vision of the world as it could have been if Japan, Japan had lost the war. And again, that actual incident Dick claims happened to him in the 70s, almost 15 years after he wrote this book. So I, I, it's almost, I think Dick has yeah. kind of, I mean, knowing that, I kind of look at Dick as a guy who is not that in touch with his own reality. And when he writes stuff, it's almost like he's on a mass trip which I have no problem with. It's a good book, but like... It probably is. Probably is. It, it, it's hard to pin down what's... It's almost like it's written on a wheel on the back of an hey, well, on a technic, on, on a technical note, it's one, two, three, four, five. Well, I checked this uh, Schmopes site, who which gave an analysis of the book, Schmopes. and they list out there's like seven point of view characters in this in this book, and it's not a long book. So it's Dick wrote this book from like a rotating point of view. Um, most of the points of view are from Frank Frank, Tagomi, and Childen and Juliana that you, that you mentioned, and this Nazi defector Baines, but. It, Phil said that he wrote this this way because at some point he was fascinated with uh, this Japanese literature that was based on, I think, a French style where these students had had written from different rotating points of view. And so he adopted that to write this story since it was going to involve, an, you know, Imperial Japan taking over the U.S. So it, it's just you, you keep getting different points of view as you go through. But they all – he does tie it together. Yeah, we, we, Ryan and I collaborated on a project years ago called Hrothgar's Heroes – a fan favorite, where we, we made five short vignettes or short cartoons that all kind of tied together for no good reason. I mean, well, it, I mean it, we wrote them. We wrote them. We <laughs> hated like two thirds of them, maybe. I, I forget how that worked. It, it, the writing was solid. The animation was hard, but we did it ourselves. I'm still kind of proud of that, despite what Seth Dodson might think. You can go fuck yourself, Seth. But the uh, <laughs> overall, but here, I'm reading this book. I mean, he, he was doing that, and maybe that is a, some kind of French style. I have no fucking idea. But like, almost, there's almost like three, I mean, any one of those three. Things I mentioned probably could have been its own book. To me, the crux of the story was really what I thought was the most interesting and most cohesive was what happened in Colorado with Juliana and Joe going to see the man in the high castle, more or less. And But everything else that happened in the book, I mean, like that could have stood alone by itself, that plot line, as a solid story structure. 
and again, I'm not diminishing the book. I, I liked this a lot. I'll give my rating at the end. I really, I, I liked it a lot. Phil Kiddick's a trip. I mean, and, but yeah, yeah, there was a lot going on. And I hate the words, I don't want to use the word convoluted because we've read that, that we read that horrible book by the uh, Dracula author. That was just bad. That was truly. Bram Stoker's uh, Layer, Layer of the White Worm. Layer of the White Worm. Uh, great movie, bad book, in my opinion. I, you know, I shared my thoughts and I was hammered, I think, when I did that. But like this, again, this is, I, I, I don't want to. I we covered that this season. We did. I don't want to diminish this as being convoluted in the sense that it's not worth reading. I'm just saying it's, it's, help, help me out here. I mean, if you're familiar with Philip K. Dick, you're not surprised by this book. But if you're not, you're. Exactly. You're not exactly. It, it, it's like, it's needlessly complex, but I appreciate the complexity, even though there's no need for it, because that's the way that Dick writes. And it's, it's kind of enjoyable. And I, I liked it better than the first book we read, the, uh, Android Jim Electric Sheep, which I think kind of, kind of fell apart in the third act. This one does not really fall apart. It kind of gets stronger as it goes on, but it, it really, when I say it out loud, the, the plot summary just sounds absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you know, so well let's yeah, let's not get to the ending yet, but yeah. let's go to I think one of the things you touched on. The grasshopper lies heavy. So in this, there's uh, a book within a book. Sorry, yeah. The, the man yeah, yeah. The, the, the man in the high castle, who the, the name of the book is, is he has written a book called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which is supposed to be based on a quote from Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes. I forgot how to it, 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 it is biblical, from, yes, in some sense. Biblical, yeah. Yeah, from, from the Bible. And, and, and it's, it's a telling an alternate history in which, uh, Japan and, uh, Germany lose the war, but that, that, the history of that does not even follow the real history of our world. It's, it's also slightly different. So, I mean, the, the confusions are compounded even further, but, that's that goes into the alternate reality of you know what is real, what is not real, and one of the things you talk about, Wilk, is the um, well, Rick. What, let me oh. just go to you. Yes. How did you feel about that element of the book where there there is a book within this world? It's it's widely distributed, but it's supposed to be banned, I think. Uh, where people are made aware of this other existence because the the book is supposed to be fiction, but people think there's something to it because the book is banned. Uh, I don't know. I was just kind of disturbed by it. It, it was almost uh, as if it was a self-serving gesture made by Philip Dick himself claiming that um, you're going to be able to change the world through just a single book as if it were used as a weapon of propaganda to influence some kind of revolt. And I think maybe in his wildest dreams, his own work would have done on the same, but you know, he reflects that within this. Own- That's what you got out of it, though. Yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty conceited. You think that yeah. the, that that his point was if if you He's read this book about himself, yeah, it was pretty self serving. Well, but no, but you're 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 saying the the this book, the grasshopper lies heavy. If if the characters read this book, it will inspire them to revolt against the Nazi and German regimes, and thus they will create a new reality for themselves. That's what you think his point was behind in- introducing oh, this Jesus, element, right? Uh, no. Or do you think conversely that that the, there is another reality? I'm not sure Dick knows. I mean, let's be fair. I'm not sure. No, I I don't think it's made very clear. I'm not sure Dick's got a plan. I mean, we're probably getting this more thought than he did. He's like, I gotta make a fucking joy pendant right now. This is bullshit. I'm gonna write a goddamn Nazi. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a, like another unending mirror of what he's doing within his own work, and it, it just kind of goes on and on, and it's just reflective of you know. His project is a project within his project that reflects his yeah, project. Yeah, it's like, and yeah, sorry, go, yeah. Phil McKinney was a great writer. That's it. I think he needed a great editor because I, I, I don't, I don't buy the contention that his books are that great because there's a lot of great movies made out of them. I don't think that I enjoy them, but like, I really don't see him as a guy that had a great master plan when he wrote this stuff. It's like, Mm-mm. he started it. Well, yeah. No, obviously he didn't. He's consulting the IG. Yeah, there you go. Uh, throughout Touché. the entire thing. Touché. 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 Yeah. Touché. Which is basically, yeah. Yeah. well, and the, and the characters in the book actually consult each and when when they they finally reach the man in the high castle, the man in the high castle is it reveals that he consulted the I Ching to write the book. The grasshopper lies heavy, and they consulted again to figure out what is the meaning of the book. But then I think the result is it, it says that the book is true. It's not true. It's, they don't say the book is true in the sense that this will inspire people to make change. They say the book is true, like there is another alternate reality. That's what I got out of this, and that's classic Philip K. Dick. Which I yeah. love about it. Classic him. dick. Mm-hmm. What is real? You, you could have looked at it that real? way. Sure. Yeah. You, you well, some, some might that call way. that a complete cop out, but I like Philip K. Dick. So I'm not going to say that. I, Phil, and Philip K. Dick was confronted about that, and he actually, in, 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 it said that he blames the ending on the I Ching because he used the I Ching to write the ending, and he said that the I Ching was a malevolent spirit, and it really, and he, I didn't he decide said that, to do that. Yeah, he said the I Ching copped out at the end. <laughs> 
<laughs> he was pissed off at the I Ching too, from what I uh, read. But I, I also read some commentators say that, or some reviewers saying, but how else could he have ended this book without this kind of ambiguous ending? And I think that's a good point. Would it have been a better ending if the book goes into an alternate dimension and you see that, or if it, a revolt is inspired, or would that take away some of the the mist and 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 magic in this book? It really depends what kind yeah. of story you're writing. Are you writing a horror story? Are you writing like a slice of life? Are you writing an epic series of novels? He was. You're writing a Philip K. Dick. Book. Yeah. In which case, it was the right ending because Philip K. Dick does not really end things. He just stops writing. I think, and that's kind of what happened here. <laughs> Yep. Well, okay, so one of the other elements that I found fascinating is you talked about the industry in the book of the, the Japanese were f- fascinated with Americana and getting real, like, real life antiques. And they were so fascinated by it that they were willing to buy fakes or look the other way and buy fakes. Maybe, maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly. And there's I, this- I don't know why it's noted that Japanese are fascinated with the same shit that Americans are fascinated with. I mean, you're talking Marilyn Monroe, old Western, you know, uh, arms, you know, you know, guns and stuff. Americans have the same fetishes. They do, but it's, when not, the Jap- it's not reciprocal. When the Japanese have those fetishes, it's like, oh my God, you know, they, they're they totally obsessed with this stuff. Well, because, no, because they're, we they're, are outsiders, they're, they're outsiders coming in. Yeah, it's not reciprocal. We don't have the same mutual fascination with their culture, I don't That's think. That's with any other culture, though. But I'm saying, but and, we don't share the same every other, fascination with their culture. But it's culture. not just the Japanese. It's not just the Japanese. What do you mean? It, it's, it's a lot of other cultures, countries and stuff that are really into American media and, and pop culture coming out of America. Uh, the, the biggest import out of America is the media and the, the creative arts. Uh, and that's all over the world. So when the Japanese take interest, we, we kind of noticed that and we're like, oh my God, well, that's weird. They've got this kind of contained culture over there and they, they like our stuff. Well, that's not just with the Japanese. That's all over the world, you know? Well, I don't think that, I, I didn't think that was weird at all. I mean, I felt like, you know, people are uh, obsessed with ancient Rome. People are obsessed with a lot of past cultures and, and how they operated. I, I don't know. I didn't really think that was that weird. I, 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 I'm just. If Japan conquered a, a part of America, I, I'm stressed out because seem- we're singling out the Japanese for liking our shit. And it's really kind of like, well, they're just kind of reflecting our feelings about our own shit, you know, guns and Marilyn Monroe and, you know, sort of like Mickey uh, Mouse watches. Sure. You know, well, one of the things he talks about is that they want historicity. Okay. And I found this, this is part of the genius of Philip K. Dick. Okay. And there's a, this masterful scene where I forget if it's children is involved in it, the actual antiques dealer and someone else. And he, he, I think he does this in the book, right? He takes out two lighters and he shows the lighters and he say, one of these lighters has historicity. What does that mean? The history see is this, this lighter was um, in Roosevelt's pocket when he got shot and assassinated. Mm-hmm. And this other lighter is just a normal Zippo lighter. And he gives them to this other character and says, can you can you tell the difference? And I think the character, I think he doesn't, right? And it's, it's a big dollar value difference, right? And sure. it's so genius of Philip K. Dick because he, he, he it gets into the thing of what is real and what is not real. Because you look at it mm-hmm. and there's like, yeah, yeah. a, a lighter point, like right. that that was in Roosevelt's pocket would seem so valuable and have so much worth to it and yet it's no different than this other one there might be a slight scratch on it or something and 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 so philip k dick gets into what is what does it mean to be authentic what does it mean to to be real and then that's ultimately the question of what is real which he gets into in a lot of his works you know Wilk, what did you think about that i thought you were checking out some article about the authenticity elements yeah expound on ryan's idea <laughs> i think ryan's idea is nonsense to be honest i mean like nothing against really it. why well i mean, I, I just think you're extrapolating more meaning when there is none I mean, I guess that's what people do sometimes, but I mean, I, I don't want to like, really? I, I don't know. I, I think Phil Kadig was an interesting guy, but I don't think he was that great of a writer. I think he had some great ideas. Well, to me, this is the strength of this book is this element here is because he, he plays with what is real. He's got this possible alternate reality with this the grasshopper lies heavy, but then he, he kind of echoes on that or compounds that or, or um, furthers that point by playing into the fascination with artifacts versus not artifacts. And he's like, these things should be the same, but they're not considered the same. Who, who makes the determination? of that. It's the holder, the holder of the objects Im- imbuing some kind of different uh, power to it than, than it would have otherwise objectively. And and then that, this goes back to classic F- Philip K. Dick. What makes reality? Is our own perception of reality? Is my reality real? Because that's what I perceive as opposed to what you perceive. See, I, I always consider this a bunch of heavy bullshit. I mean, it's a fun thing to talk about if you're trying to get laid or you're an acid, but like reality is real. It doesn't, if you perceive it as not something different, I guess fine, you're high. 
but if you perceive there to be a, a road, there's no road, you fall into a river, you drown. So, no, reality isn't what you perceive. Reality is what's real. So, But we all have our own different perspectives. Are we all creating our own realities? I think that's what he gets into. No, you know? we're not. <laughs> And it's very obvious. We are not creating our realities. If we did, we'd all be supermen and we would fly around and be immortal and have 35 penises and fuck 10 virgins yeah. every day. We're not doing any of that. I mean, like, no. How can you say that? Because, like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, am I really talking to you? Well. Am I really talking? I love that. Well. Am I really talking to you right now? Or am I, am I imagining that I'm talking to you? Ryan, if, if you, if you're imagining you're talking to me, then go talk to a doctor. No, you're not imagining you're talking to me. We're talking. It's being recorded. It's being played. And then people are going to listen to this. Yeah. I mean, people that always say, uh, reality as you perceive are stupid. They're stupid people that are trying to sound smart. There's that cla- uh, Andre Agassi well, commercial. Account, accounts, accounts of reality are perceived, you know. Um, but you can't just discount it. Like, yes. because look at yeah. go to a museum why are some things in a museum and some things are not because what? we through our own perceptions are putting things on okay, that's these not objects a perception. that wouldn't yeah. otherwise exist no, people put things in museums because they decide to put them in a museum perception I mean yeah perception you can make a mistake but real is real whatever what, what things we, are is what things are document reality though when, you, when you're documenting reality you can be the best objective journalist it's still perceived but uh, when you're that objective and you you have you garner that trust of the public there shouldn't be any kind of question whether it's real or not i i uh, and i very yeah so, i very seldom myself question what is real i mean like yeah it'd be nice right. if I but could, look at what the nazis perpetrated on people and they created their own reality with that whole okay, uh, movement again, again that's not creating reality those are things that happened you don't create your own reality what we do is what we do that is what is that is what is happening right now. I mean, you, you can, you can. It, but they created like people to. They created right. emotions in people. All right, and they that's created, enough with that topic. Well, right. Laser yeah, heaven mean, boy, uh, come on. Oh, Rick's done. Well, Rick's I'm done. just saying. Let's not. No, Rick's done. No, Rick's that's done. Fine, but we're not like ten yeah, years old. No, Rick's done. Rick's done. What? We'll move on. Move on. We'll move. We'll move on. Rick's done. So another thing I wanted to talk about, since Rick's done with that, uh, is in which I found. I, I guess maybe I, we're not. I'm not super well versed in Philip K. Dick, but I don't think he's got like a lot of action in his well, books. You've you, you been using the word classic Dick all night. I, mean, I feel like you must be semi well versed in him. Like <laughs> well, that's classic Dick. I've read classic, the- It's like it's like your old sewing circle buddy Dick. Well, oh, have, that is so Dick. I have some like. <laughs> You know, idea about him through my research and also what you've I said, read, but you, I'm you've not said classic an dick at least three times. So I feel like you can't throw out I classic still stand, dick I still stand, and then throw still out stand. I mean, the them. I mean, <laughs> good observation. Though. I'm not. Look, I, I stand by that statement, but I'm not an expert. But I, um, Boing. but my reality is there's some acute action sequences in here that seem a little different than what I've I've seen in the past with Philip K. Dick. And one of them is where there's a Nazi defector. This is an important subplot, right? Japan and Germany have an uneven, un, uneasy peace going on between them, and well, there it's is a cold war. It's a cold war between Japan and Germany. Yeah, essentially. And this German uh, defector has secretly gone to the Japanese uh, states so that he can meet with this. The uh, I think the trade official Tagomi, right, or someone else. I think they used Tagomi to to meet, and he wants right. to let. He essentially thinks what's going on is Hitler is still alive and he's going to die, they think, of syphilis. And there's going to be a, a power vacuum. And this Nazi defector thinks the next person who takes over is going to want to start a war so they can take over the whole United States. And this guy, I guess, is more of a pacifist and he wants to prevent that. So he wants to pass along information to the Japanese that will thwart this attempt to restart another war and more bloodshed. And there is a acute scene of action where he is trying to meet with the these Japanese officials and the SS or, or some other aspect of the Nazi military uh, f- facilities or departments has figured out that this is going on. And while he's meeting with the, the Japanese people, they are, understand that they're, that some men are coming to kill them to stop this meeting. And there's an actual scene of violence where uh, the ca- character of Tagomi has to shoot these people dead in his own office. They're in like an office building. And by shooting these people, he, he prevents them from killing the Nazi defector and you know, it kind of saves a day for that, but it affects him philosophically because I don't think he said to kill before. And ironically, he uses one of these remake, uh, called 44s. Yeah. yeah called 44 pistols. That's a counterfeit pistol, but it, it, it sets off and, and he's the one who then goes off and he, he's kind of having a crisis of mind because he killed people and he's not used to violence. And he goes off to the jewelry store where, where Frank, or uh, Frank, Frank has sold some Frank of this handmade Frank, Frank. has Sorry. sold some of this handmade jewelry to children. And not to get too convoluted, but the guy Tagomi buys this jewelry. He wants to get rid of his gun because he's done with violence, but he ends up buying the jewelry, this jewelry. Makes him go crazy though. The jewelry makes him no, it, kind it, of coupled, have coupled go, with the on. fact that he shot these two agents. 
Because I mean, it's probably the first time he actually killed people, uh, right? And right, he's he's going crazy. Uh, you know, he's got. Although it's it's pretty clear he's justified. These people were going to kill him if he didn't kill them. Mm-hmm. But he's still having a crisis of mind. Mm-hmm. Did you say Asians and or he, agents? He said he killed two agents. He, he, he said agents, agents. Nazi Asians. Okay, not Nazi. No, n- Nazi. I like no I, Nazi Asians. I like Nazi Asians better. <laughs> He killed the Nazi so, Asians. Those Asians are Nazis. That's, yeah. that's when Tagomi <laughs> takes this jewelry. He buys this particular piece of jewelry, which is interesting because the piece, as it's described, is an actual jewelry piece that Phil made and, and gave away to one of his neighbors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so when he's holding this piece, he has sort of a – it's not a flashback. It's a, He has a um, hallucination or he has a vision of the alternate reality where the, the, you know, the Japanese have lost the war, not won the war. And that kind of changes his whole trajectory – and what ends up happening is he goes back to work and Frank Frank, the guy who made the jewelry, has been captured by the Nazis in the interim. He doesn't know Childen or Tagomi or, or he knows Childen, but he doesn't know Tagomi. And the Nazis are going to de- deport him back to Germany to be executed. Well, the, the, Why do they the need Japanese- to fly him to Germany to execute Thank him? you! Thank you! Yeah. Again, because because it, I'll tell you why. Bad, it's, it's, no, bad it's, rain. it's bad rain. No, 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 no. No, it's genius. It's, it's because not genius. He's in- it's incredibly it's convenient. <laughs> he's. Guys, he's in Japan. He's in the Japanese states. The Nazis, it's not their, their, their territory. So they can't just take him up to the buffer zone. They can't P- they, put him on a bus. He got arrested. They can't, they need the Japanese to sign off on him being deported. And Tagomi ultimately refuses to sign off after his, re- yeah, after his, he, he's a subject of Japan, but I mean, right. He doesn't necessarily have to be in Germany. Well, they can't know. kill him on, in, uh, they can't kill him on foreign soil. Not legitimately. They can kill him in the buffer zone. Illegitimately. About like, you know, but 300 they, miles. They got to get him off. Three hundred miles away. He, he's in Rick. He's in jail. They need to get him out of the out of their system. They're not going to so fly they, him out of jail on a rocket to to Germany. That is what they're going to do. That's what they want to do. Right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That's all. It's I'm because saying. He, it's because he, he's not their citizen. Yes, I, I I know what they say in the book, but it just seems stupid. Yeah. They could just bust him over a few states. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the moment in the book where he ties these different plots together. Yeah. And Frank Frank making this jewelry ends up inspiring Tagomi to let him go free, even though they don't know each other. Okay. And I don't know. I so almost gave was, up on the book when I read that. I'm like, oh really? My God. No, I thought it was- not really, but I mean, <laughs> I mean that, that was just like one thing. It's a bit ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I thought it was powerful. Well, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Do you? I mean, yeah. Boy, this is all like just bad writing. I mean, I, I like Vic. It's a good book, but like, this is lazy writing. This is, this is like just. <laughs> no, to me, this is this is the strength of his writing is right it? here. Because to me. Why else do you it, like this book? Not because of the incredibly weak plot points you mentioned that it just seemed like he pulled out of his ass. I mean, it's like, oh, well, I don't, I'm going to free this guy because I'm Jesus, maybe, the end. I mean, who. It just—it's just weak. It's not a very really tight plot. I mean, why did the Germans actually, you know, why did they execute, you know, the Jews in Poland and in Russia? They had concentration camps all over Europe. Uh, they didn't have to fly them back to Germany <laughs> I mean, because yeah. they had taken Rick because they had taken Rick, over those okay, territories. Rick, he, can, can we, the Japanese, this, they were in I, Japanese I, territory. I can pull You're off just the not official the sidebar where I can talk to Rick without Ryan interfering. Rick. <laughs> On these flights back to yes. Germany for execution, what's the in-flight meal? Do you think? Like, what's happening on that flight as they're flying in the back for the execution? Like, is there a movie? Is there? Well, they got to take some hair strands, check his genealogy, make sure that he's you know Jewish. I guess it's all due to the rigorousness of uh, you know <laughs> German science, and you know maybe you know that's what Ryan is getting. Do they at. make you wear a seatbelt uh, though if they're, if they're flying to execute? Oh, of course. That's, that, yeah. that's ironic. Mean, you have to follow protocol. That's ironic. Okay. Okay, cyber over. Sorry, Ryan. Right. Go on. Yes. <laughs> it's quite simple. One country can't not go into another country and pull out their citizens to execute them. Not legitimately. Of course, they could do it underhandedly, but he's in jail, so I think that's why they can't just get him out. Unless I guess they... it's more of an official thing. You know, it's, right. It's, it's right. an official exactly. thing. It's not so much the official George Lucas horrible prequel politics that you're playing right now that are just really annoying and, and dull. It's just the fact that the guy had some bar- bullshit vision magically, and then he magically spares the life of some guy for no good reason because of that. Well, if you, th- I guess if you think it's a bullshit vision but if you think that is an alternate reality then that changes things i guess it's it's what you take from the book is it a, is there an alternate he, reality? he he needs to insert a diplomatic feel in this book and you know he, he did it right there okay so. the other element of action was was juliana she hooks up with this joe cinderella guy cindella guy and uh, who befriends her Ow. and is all romantic with her and then changes and it turns out he's a nazi assassin to try to kill the man in the high castle <sighs> Yeah, what, what did you look? You're huffing and puffing over there. What did you think about that whole sequence? 
I don't know. Wait, first of all, Wilk, why are you huffing and puffing? Just hit my funny bone. God damn it. Oh, are you all right? Puff. Yeah, it just smarts. Ugh. Oh, so does that mean you're not going to be funny the rest of the show? I don't know. Mm. All right, were you asking why did she fuck the Nazi guy and then kill him? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if I was a chick, I'd probably want to fuck one Nazi. It's, it's a good story. Like, hey, uh, you yeah, you're, you're the you're the you're the, you're the lo- she's an attractive girl. You're the locker you know. room. Years later, you're doing Pilates. You're like, hey, hey, Gina, what's up? I fucked a Nazi in Colorado one time. He, oh my god, he, what was that he like? He wasn't what he seemed at the time. I mean, I, I mean, she, she thought right, he was he's a like truck re- driver, right? He's really nice to her. He's supposed to be a truck driver, Ex- but then extra, he flips. Extra, he extra wasn't points. actually very nice to her. He was not nice to her. Yeah, he's kind of a dick. The whole story. It's like he was cast as a really? suspicious. Yeah. Well, Even the first time you meet him, it's like, yeah. like they were like they were shadowed as a suspicious character whose face was like when someone said something bad about Germany, his face changed. It's like he was, he was, he was yeah, totally. That's true. I mean, it's different. The TV series is quite a different portrayal. But of I him. thought I, that I they know. had some moments of intimacy when they were alone. When they were out of the diner, I felt like you're right. You're right. When his dick was inside of her, that was a very intimate moment. <laughs> I would, I would, I would agree with you there. A classic guy move. Yeah, I a mean, classic guy was, move. Like when he was inside of her, penetrating and thrusting, that was quite intimate. But when he was starting to beat her up and tell her not to talk, that was less intimate. And then when he tried to kill the main character of the story, <laughs> even less intimate because he's a fucking Nazi assassin. And I think she knew it. I just think she wanted the fucking Nazi for the story. I mean, if he was a black Nazi, double story. She takes real agency and she kills him very violently. What does she do? She sticks something in his neck. She uses her judo and then she murders him. Yes. And she doesn't. She sticks something in his neck and cuts it's her just artery. Just a razor blade that she found oh, yeah, in the hotel room. Yeah. yeah it was, and it, but it's, you know, it's very visceral and very the, violent. The, the, the sex scenes and even the, even the um, uh, the murder scene where, where she mortally wounds him. Uh, it's not written in very much detail, but you just kind of put two and two together. It's it's not vivid Does, at all. Really? Uh, I, I, no. I, I mean, I really feel like I got a strong sense of this guy bleeding on the ground. He, he knows he's going to die, and he's telling her, he's talking to her and, and bleeding the, out. The actual uh, event of her slashing his jugular, jugular vein was uh, kind of uh, invective. It, it just it, it didn't really, he, he didn't, he, he wasn't. You know, vivid about. He was it. a bad Nazi. I mean, I felt like he was a lousy assassin. He could have played that whole I mean, thing yeah. out. If he, he was such a dick to her, he could have ridden the whole thing out. Philip K. Dick. No, not, yeah, he was. He was not a Philip K. Dick to her. He, he was just a dick to her. <laughs> you know, if not Philip K. was cool, but like, yeah, he, if he was nicer, he could have gotten like some Colorado side pussy and then gone and killed the guy. Instead, he has to be a complete dick and then he gets stabbed in the neck, bleeds out, yeah. gets judo by Ju- someone named Juliana, which is actually a very lesbian name. You think about it, and he. <laughs> Oh shit! It is. There's there's a lot of Julies and Ginas and Julianas in the lesbian community, and I say that with love. A lot of softball players. Oh, but I mean, I would say as a name, look at your lesbians. How many more stereotypes can we? It's not a stereotype. I'm just saying I know a lot of Julies and Ginas and Julianas that are lesbians. Volleyball players hugging each other after every set. <laughs> yeah, but okay. again, but, but again, so but I mean, I felt like that was one of the stronger sequences in the book. That that was more riveting to me. I mean, that was a strong it, action. It, it was. It was. I, I enjoy reading because of the violence. But what bothered me is this guy has one mission to kill this guy, and he completely subverts the mission by bringing the side pussy along, and then she kills him because he fucks it up by being an ass and he blows his cover. I, I just feel like if your one job is this one thing, why not just bang her on the road and then go kill the guy? I mean, why why bring her along? Nothing good's gonna happen there. He was kind of a shitty assassin. Well, he needed he needed her. He needed her to get in with the man in the high castle. It was supposedly the man in the high castle liked the type of woman she was. That was he had. That was why he she was brought her along. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I su- I suppose you're right. That's but it, it seemed like that's, I mean, that's what he that's, said. That's what he said. I feel like he was full of shit there too. It's like you know, like hey, I'm a guy in a truck and I like your book. Can I come in? Yeah, yeah, great. He used her, you know. Go figure. It happens. All and, the time. and I guess by the time we get there, the guy has like no security. He can just walk in and pop him in the head, anyways. That's why. I, but they didn't know that at the time. Do some fucking do some the, recon, Nazi assassin. I, well, it's the man in the high castle. How can you just do recon? You're driving a truck. It's the best cover. Say, hey, I'm here to deliver these mattresses. Italian truck driver. He doesn't have the truck. Anymore. You have a delivery over here. I didn't order this. You didn't. Well, let me check. Put it back <laughs> in my car. Bam. You're dead. <laughs> Whose castle's high now, bitch? End of story. <laughs> Dick out. Dick out. Dick out for Harabe. And on that note, why don't we wrap things up for the book episode? Unless you guys have anything else you want to add about the book specific. Dick out. Tweet. Tweet. Okay. Tweet. <laughs> All right. So then let's do our final comments and star ratings on this book. I will go to Rick first. Final comments and star rating for this book. Go ahead, Rick. Um, yeah, you know, 
I don't know. I'm kind of speechless here because the book is convoluted, and I'm sure the listener knows this for sure, even if he or she has not read the book just by listening to this podcast. So in that respect, it was kind of frustrating, uh, but you know, that's Philip K. Dick for you. Um, but it is mind expanding and, uh, it, it is daring. And, you know, sometimes you just can't believe what this guy is writing. So in that respect, uh, I have favorable thoughts about it and I will end up giving it three stars. I'd like to give it four, but. I don't know. I think it just drags and it's not as uh, impressive as some of those other stuff that we've read before. Hmm. Okay. Wilk, what do you got for us? I'm going to bring out a new scale here to the show. I'm going to call it the drug literary scale. And that's where I'm going to get my rating from. I'm going to give, as long as it's out of five, I'm going to give drugs various ratings. Okay. On the one star, you have a cigarette. That's one star. It's a form of drug. Two star, alcohol. I like that. Three star, marijuana. Four star, LSD. Five star, really good mushrooms. On that, Rating scale. I would rank LSD after mushrooms. And that's fine. I mean, that's subjective. I, 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 would put, I would put a great mushroom over LSD. But Rick, that's your reality. This is Wilkes' reality. They don't have to be the same reality. It's not, it's not reality. It's my opinion. God, <laughs> reality is reality. This is completely my opinion. Anyways, I would say, I, Are you I would sure? say LSD. This seems like an LSD. Wait, wait. You didn't get the five stars. Five stars is mushrooms. I would say acid or LSD what? is a four star. And I, I'd say that this book reminded me of somebody who was on acid. And if I was on acid and I, I read this book, I, 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 mean, I, like, I like the book. Book, but I also like acids. I'm gonna give it four stars. I think this is a very LSD inspired book based on the way that he tied things together, everything's connected, the crystals. It seemed like a guy who wrote this while he was on acid, and I can appreciate that. So I'm gonna give it the acid rating four stars. Okay. I feel like this this is if you're familiar with Philip K. Dick, you know what you're getting with this. But it's a different. I feel like the the read of this book, the flow of this book felt a little more polished than the other stuff we've read. I really like it. Highly recommend it. And I'm actually going to bump my rating up. Uh, I've been thinking about this before the show. I'm going to give this four and a half stars. This is not perfect. I'm not sure it's his best work. He did win the award for it, but it's, it's, it's just really great. And I, I it, it's just not perfect. So it's, I really want to recommend checking it out and, and anyone should, and it, it's pretty accessible. And, um, I disagree with the, I mean, I guess there is low points, but I feel like the action sequences were nice surprises and, 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 and it's not a long book. And Phil K. Dick, he's not a hard read. It's just the subject dick's, matter is more difficult. It's not hard. Your dick's not hard. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna get. Four and a half stars. Four and a half stars. And again, in Ryan's defense, now that you're under attack, when this book came out in 1962, this was a much more novel concept. I feel like I've seen about a yeah, dozen sure. versions of this kind of story in popular media, where this side won this, be it on TV or movie or books, comic book world, things like that, like alternate realities, so to speak, bizarre worlds. This was very. Uh, I don't think. I think it was a fresher idea when it came out too, which I think drew some of the critical. Although, but he was inspired by the, that uh, Jubilee book that was about. About the Civil War with the South yeah. one. You, so why he, must he why was, must you crucify yourself? I'm defending your opinion here. So I'm saying I, I get the critical doesn't, claim. It doesn't feel like it. I, I understand the critical claim when it came out because it was, it was a newer idea. I'm not saying it was your most original idea. I'm saying it was newer. It'd be like if, if somebody wrote a book today about a theme park that had been horribly long. Well, you got Westworld, Jurassic Park. It wouldn't seem that new. It was a great piece of literature. I think the reason it got the critical claim it did when it came out wasn't so much because of the writing. Like it was because of the idea. That, and Philip K. Dick was an idea man. He wasn't a great writer. I mean, he's a great idea. And again, when I say writer, I'm saying that in a strictly a constructive, cognitive, literal sense. I mean, he's not Stephen King. He's not Jared Tolkien. And you can't read his books as a cohesive whole and say, well, that made sense. But his ideas, that's where his genius lies. That's where his creativity, I think. And so that, and that's where I give the four stars to. I like the idea. I agree with you that he that he is an ideas man, but I disagree about the the coherence. I, I he, he can be difficult at times, but I think the strength of this is not just about the idea of Germany and Japan winning, but it's also the classic, as I say, Philip K. Dick elements of questioning reality and stuff. And I think classic. he really works them very well and they come out this is this is the height of his writing. You know, he did a lot of masterpieces at this time period um in his career, and uh this is one one of those I, really a lot of masterpieces well in his career this, you say that as a matter this of is fact. this is when his well you know I, I guess i'm sort of basing it on this biography I mean, that I read. you're basically regurgitating right. something it, that, it, yeah, it's not mind. that well written of a book it's it's entertaining but disagree i disagree i know you disagree i give it four stars but i'm saying it's not that well it's like a masterpiece is a stretch it's a really creative idea but like i'm not going to give this five stars well me either but i'm just saying okay. it'd, be, it'd be nice if a really good writer who was a good writer in a technical sense took this idea and ran with it and that's 
we're going to go. The 4K the, dick is not about no, no, but a, a technical segue, sense, okay? Segue, segue. He, he's not, the, he's not hey, hey, the hey, 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 technical segue, writer. The, you, don't, right. you don't pick segue, up a 4K just dick. shut up. Let me finish my sentence. My God. That's where the strength in the TV show lies because they're not doing an exact reimagination of the book. And they kind we'll of, get into that when the TV show. Oh, Come on. Ryan, let me finish a sentence. My God. <laughs> it's, I, I, I've been saying this sentence. It's, it, it's nice when you watch the TV show and you have a team of writers taking this cool idea and making it something that's more digestible and cohesive and makes sense and is less acidy. That's all. Go on with your... I your just, you, I, it's, you, this book, you can't disagree I disagree. With me. This book you has can't soul. Because I'm not saying I'm, factual. I'm just giving my I'm thoughts. Not, I'm saying yeah. you pick up this book because it's got soul. You're not looking for the technical beats in this no, book. No, actually... It's, it's a it, Philip K. It, Dick it, book. It, He's got the soul so that drives you. Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't know what technical beats people look for in a book, but usually it's a story that makes sense. So, I mean, whether you, whatever. It's it's like an array of haikus. I mean, yeah. it, it was kind of written with uh, a little bit of mysticism and it, he could have gone in any direction and he did. He allowed the I Ching to allow him to do that. And, and it's beautiful. It wasn't really his work. It was an inspiration from his readings of the I Ching. So you can't give him all the credit for this book. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's not, beautiful. And I liked it for a start. Okay, it's beautiful. Fine. Uh, yeah, and I don't really disagree that much. So it's not like I'm saying it's a horrible book. You're saying it's great. You only disagree with me by a half a star. Half a star. <laughs> half a bag of popcorn. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's move on. We got a fit man. I'm an ass man. I don't know. What do you want me to say here? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I will invite everyone to check out our website, www.nodeodorant.com. We write reviews, uh, or we put our reviews up there, and we also give show notes and stuff, and sometimes we have some fun factoids. We'll invite you guys to check that out. And also, on our website, Rick was talking to me about this offline at some point, that um, we do have an archive index. If you go to our website, nodeodorant.com, there, and you go to our um, no, menu, there's an archive index that lets you know all the titles we've covered. So if you want to just peruse what we've covered by subject matter in alphabetical order that is on our website so feel free to check that out and if you're looking to see if we covered a topic it's on there i try to keep it updated so it's a it's a good tool if you're just you want to listen for specific subjects you can check out what we've covered books or movies tv series um you know short stories whatever so i'll plug that and also you know we have a, tw- a twitter account we have a facebook account we're on a, a lot of different podcast mediums itunes tune in radio google play iheart radio so please check us out we've got a youtube page follow us there and we invite you to give us comments on our podcast and feedbacks. We cherish that. So on that note, okay. I will invite people to c- tune back in later in the month when we cover the Man in the High Castle TV series created by Frank Spotnitz. And otherwise, I will say... Well, t- well two, two things. On that note, I uh, had a coward today. His name's Tony. He lives in Bulgaria, but he flew into the United States. He works by... Fr- Tony from Bulgaria. Tony from Bulgaria for the last two weeks. And I- I'm sitting there, and he's like, wait, hey, hey, Will, do you want to come to Chicago with me tonight? I'm going to go there. My wife is in Bulgaria. I'm going to Chicago with my friend. I'm like, uh, Tony, I don't want to go to Chicago with you. He's like, why not? I'm like, I got to have me dinner and do my podcast. Like, you have a podcast? I'm like, I have a podcast. He's like, is it on TuneIn Radio? I'm like, it is. And he pulls out his phone and he's like, oh, look, you are crazy. You have a podcast. You never cease to amaze me. And then he started playing the podcast. And he liked it. <laughs> so... I mean, I, I just want to say, even if you're not into sci-fi or shit like that, you're going to have great comments, like the, like the classic big comments tonight in the debates that we have, and it's, it's it's a good show. You should definitely check us out, and uh, TuneIn Radio is a great app, so I would definitely get on there. I want to give a shout-out to Tony from Bulgaria. I'm sorry for making fun of your accent, but it, it is hilarious because you're foreign. Anyways, you're a good attorney, though. <laughs> but the point, yeah, but I, I try to make the podcast as widely available as, as, as we can get it. And, so. and, you, and, and you do a good job. I also would like to use this time to read my eight-minute treatise on Black Life's matters and share my thoughts on that. So, <laughs> and so with that, we'll say good night, <laughs> goodbye, everyone, good night. Okay. okay. So, good night. So what the black? We'll say good night. We'll say good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> For more information on the topics discussed in this episode, or to read our show notes and find us on social media, visit nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. For more information on David Wilkinson, visit drycracker.com. For more information on Richard Mell, check out his profile at goodreads.com. The theme music for this podcast was written by John Doyle from the band Ida Klein. You can visit him at i-decline.com. Voiceover for this podcast was provided by me, Margaret O'Reilly. Well, that 
concludes our episode. We hope you've learned a lot. Again, thanks for listening to our show. And always, always remember, there is no deodorant in outer space. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Oh, I'm getting wave files. <laughs> All right. Finish up Hearthstone, Wilk. Slither. Yes. Hey, what name do you usually use, if any? Ooh, mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the alias uh, King Dildo. Um... Okay, so I have some wave files. They're sexy. They're sexy wave files. I'm going to... Uh. <laughs> Wave files. You got that uh, mic boosted up on a book or something, Wilk, so we can get a good quality uh, capture of your audio? Uh, sure, as far as you know. I knew that was coming. What? I was just like... <laughs> yeah, I was just anticipating that comment from Ryan. Uh, Ryan's comments are... We all were. So predictable. So choice. Okay, are we all farting? Do we have wave files? Yeah. I have wave files. Can you guys hear the car alarm going on in the background outside my window? Yeah. I was, <laughs> Someone's car is getting broken into right now, I think. I can't hear it. <laughs> okay, good. Don't so, be so paranoid. Let's go. <laughs> we won't worry about that. No? Yeah. I heard some kind of, like, static. That uh, wasn't that. No, I didn't hear anything. Suited him to do this book. Right. There, there's a lot of people who have... Kind of like a. Uh, hey, can you um tell? Can you put like more crinkling in the background while you're talking? Because we can still kind of understand what me. you're saying. That's not me. I think Wilk's sitting in his kitchen right now. And oh he's, well, he's got the whole family in there. We can still hear what you're saying, but if we could just crink a little bit more, then we won't be able to quite make it out. And I think that'll be better. You were saying something about Phil K. Dick being banned from a college. Hi, Sarah. Banned from a college? I didn't say anything about that. No, I made that no, up. Not that be kind of interesting. He was. Okay. Well, I think he was. Was it? No, no. He just left on his own accord. Um, but yeah, yeah, he only did like a semester, right? Do a podcast. Yeah. Never popcorn. Let's do that.